morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to start today's colloquium. Uh, I welcome you. Uh, our today's speaker is Professor Tomasz Dietl, whose uh, research interests concentrate on the physics of magnetism and spin related phenomena. He is a co founder of a research domain called Spintronics, where uh, not only a charge of the uh, carrier, but also its spin is manipulated and utilized. Uh, Professor Tomasz Dietl has published hundreds of original research papers and uh, their works gathered more than 34,000 citations. And um, the most seminal paper uh, entitled Zener Model Description of Fermagnetism in Thin Plant Magnetic Semiconductors gathered around 10,000 citations, which maybe as a curious fact, if you calculate the number of days from this year 2000, when this paper was published in Science, uh, you may figure out that on average from 20 years, at least one citation per day comes to this paper. Uh, and um, uh, Professor Dilt was a principal investigator in a number of research projects. Um, he, uh, including ERC project, and apart from uh, citations, an international recognition of Professor Dietl reveals in uh, frequent membership of uh, program committees of scientific conferences and numerous invited lectures on these conferences. Uh, he's a laureate of a number of prizes uh, in Poland and uh, abroad, and uh, he serves uh, as, a, as a member uh, in a number of uh, scientific, scientific journals. And maybe last but not least, I would like to mention societal, or let's say, pro bono involvement of our today's speaker. To mention, to mention only uh, membership of, um, in, of uh, Scientific Council of European Research uh, uh, Council and the uh, steering committee uh, of this uh, uh, research council as well as uh, membership in the Council of our Polish National Research Center. And uh, today uh, we are going to hear how from fundamental research in spin-related phenomena we can turn to uh, standard units. Thank you and uh, so the floor is yours. Thank you, Janek, very much. It hurt. It's, of course, <coughs> a great honor and privilege to <coughs> be able to speak today. I would like to acknowledge the organizer for inviting me, but also I would like to welcome on my <coughs> talk Professor Rubleski. He is my teacher. Uh, and many things I'm going to speak about are. <coughs> first time I heard during his lectures. Uh, Professor Wroblewski, probably you will not be angry if I say you are a senior person here uh, looking on the audience. Second person I would like to welcome here is the youngest person in the audience. Here is David Bugajewski, with whom we work together. Could, David, could you show yourself? We started to work together <coughs> when he was in <coughs> last year and still in Poznan school, high school. And he's very kind to say that due to our common work, he decided to do not go to informatics, but to go to physics. And he is now a student of the first year physics. Third person I'm very pleased to see here. Thank you. And I would like to personally welcome Krzysztof Pachutski. I hope <coughs> that he will give the seminar together with me. As you know, Krzysztof is chairing a physical constant task group in Kodatak Commission 
of data for science and technology. So Krzysztof probably knows a lot of things I'm going to talk to you much better and from first sources. I'm kind of newcomer to this <coughs> field a little bit compared to Krzysztof. As you know, I'm now uh, working in the NASA Research Center for interfacing magnetism and superconductivity with topological matter. And this is financed by uh, European money uh, through Foundation for Polish Science. And um, we are located in Warsaw, but we have colleagues from 14 countries uh, you see on this map. And all together we are about uh, 40 people. So, already Krzysztof mentioned atomic clock when we spoke, of course, uh, something. And probably many of you, even to come here, use atomic clock to be punctual on this presentation. Because as you know, uh, the atomic clock is uh, on, <coughs> on satellites. And if you use GPS, you, you <coughs> make use of four of atomic uh, clocks. And this demonstrates very nicely how it is important to measure something very accurately. Sometimes people think that this accurate measurements is uh, some passionate in some <coughs> uh, basement of uh, uh, measure offices who, who <coughs> measure with this 10 digit accuracy or as here, uh, eight digit accuracy. Uh, but uh, this shows that this accuracy of eight digits means that we can be localized with accuracy of few meters. So this, <coughs> our ability to measure time is uh, very important for nowadays, uh, nowadays for just everyday time. With atomic clock is related another development that uh, we measure very precisely frequency of atomic transitions. And it was decided uh, some time ago that we found that uh, rotation of Earth and <laughs> this kind of data are not very stable. So, <coughs> uh, so it is not very good units to use something related to rotation of Earth or rotation of <laughs> Earth around sound. This varies as a function of time. By contrast, as far as we can tell, all physical constants, according to astronomic data going back 10 billion years now, it looks atomic constant, are really constant. They do not change over time. And therefore, it was decided that this uh, hyperfine <coughs> transition cesium is unit, it's based for units of second. And it was also decided that light is not uh, velocity of light is not uh, <coughs> known to, uh, with 10 digits, but it was decided to give fixed number to velocity of light. And in that way, we have definition of meter, of course. So no longer we go to Paris to <coughs> check whether our meter is in <coughs> agreement with this meter <coughs> in 19th century created this <coughs> meter units, but you use this atomic physics. But these things continue, goes further. People said, should we use this kilogram or this complex definition of ampere as a force between wires <coughs> in a magnetic field? So um, uh, we know, for instance, that this kilogram, because of natural processes of oxidation and other things, despite vacuum, but vacuum is never that vacuum, uh, changes over time. Also, of course, it's very not handy, this definition with force between wires uh, depends on accuracy of other things and so on. So it was decided to kick out from <coughs> the measure units these old definitions and to use Planck constant and electric charge as base as to fix value of them. Why we could do that? We could do that because there are two beautiful macroscopic quantum phenomena which allows us, allow us to go from this atomic level, from this quantum level, to macroscopic world. One of them is superconductivity, and in particular, it is Josephson effect. We know that Josephson effect convert frequency to volta voltage. Like <coughs> Faraday law, 
<coughs> frequency to voltage, but Faraday law is not very handy, we know. <coughs> so it depends on many things, like geometry of the system and so on. Here, it does not depend on anything. Just depending on what kind of resistance you take, always proportionality between frequency and voltage is h over 2e. So this is a fantastic possibility <coughs> to, to, <coughs> to have it as a transition, tra as a something which transfers this atomic level things to microscopic world. But the second effect, which I will discuss in more detail today, is quantum hole effect. In quantum hole effect, what is <coughs> well defined with high precision, it's ratio of Planck constants to a square. It's, <coughs> as you know, its resistivity is about <coughs> 25 kilo ohms. So it's very handful, very nice to measure, 25 kilo ohms. And <coughs> having this two, we can define amper. And uh, if you think a while, you can, for instance, think about Einstein relation, mc square <coughs> equal energy from that. You can very easily see that uh, unit of kilogram can be transferred to second meter volt and, um, and uh, ohm. Yeah? So <coughs> we have this <coughs> possibility. So how we transfer now this, what I said, uh, the theory kilogram, something like second for meter or volt and ampere, how we transfer, we use Kimball balance for that. What is Kimball balance? Let's show here. Imagine that we have a weight and we want to calibrate how much kilograms it is. And therefore we have gravitational force, but on the second arm of the balance, we have coil in a magnetic field. And you can imagine that we can compensate because we know Ampere, Ampere found that if we have current and magnetic field, there is force. So we can compensate this gravitational force by putting current to this coil. Okay, you will say uh, it's uh, not very precise measurements because we have to know uh, induction of this coil, we have to know magnetic field, we have to know many things. But uh, it was found that if we now uh, move this coil with certain velocity now, and uh, we generate in this magnetic field, we generate voltage, yeah, by Faraday. No, and putting all together, you can, uh, it's a very nice exercise for students. Uh, this Kimball valence maybe could be organized also here to show to students how to measure kilogram. And uh, if you do everything properly, accuracy to measure mass is nowadays of the order of two times to eight. Uh, is it okay, Christoph? One kilogram, because if you have a smaller mass, you can multiply. Yeah. More accurate. I mean, relative. I, well, I, of course, we speak about the relative. I, all the time, speak about the relative accuracy. Thanks. <coughs> so, let's abandon this <coughs> meteorology. Uh, Janek said that I'm a specialist about magnetism. I would say that I'm a specialist about semiconductors, also, or maybe more. <coughs> what is semiconductor? We think about semiconductor, and you want to say in two words what a semiconductor is something which is very sensitive to two things, to gating, to electric field, which you apply, and to doping. And all, or virtually all, application of semiconductors in our <coughs> information communication technologies, application in uh, new energy technologies, comes from the fact that we can <coughs> change conductivity by applying voltage. So something in our transistor. How many transistors do we have in our handy? Christoph, again. 10 to 6. Ah? Uh, ah? <laughs> he was caught. He was caught. Sorry? 10 to 10. 10 to 10 nowadays. Oh, four orders of magnitude. You know. Who cares? <coughs> So, how does this transistor do they, how do they work? 
It's very simple. It's you apply voltage to something which does not conduct. <laughs> you have a capacitor, actually. As you see, uh, you have gate, metal gate, oxide, so you have capacitor. If you apply voltage to semiconductor, you create also charge, like in metal, but in metal it does not matter because uh, there are a lot of charges, but in semiconductor, it's not conducting, it starts conducting if you apply electric field. And how this uh, photovoltaic cell works, probably some of you, for instance, I have on my roof. <coughs> how they work? How do they work? Again, we dump material, we have electrons and holes, but <coughs> if you put light now, uh, there is electric field between this uh, n-type doping and uh, p-type doping, and these carriers go to electrodes and you have voltage. Yeah? So gating and doping is very important. And who was the first to found this gating phenomena? It was Nobel Prize in 40, <coughs> in 56, I think, for Bardeen, Bretton and Shockley for discovery of transistor, but actually this transistor they discover nowadays is rarely used. Now we use this transistor. And this transistor was uh, discovered. Hop, hop, hop. Hop, hop, hop. Hop. Now it started to end. Here you have this 10,000, uh, 10, uh, 10 million, 10 billion transistors. Size of transistor is for nanometer. So 10,000 <coughs> less than your hair. And cross section of hair, you can put 100,000 of them. <coughs> and if you have centimeter square, <coughs> you have this 10 billion. And uh, uh, what is interesting here, also, for physicists, that this curve tends to saturate. Yeah? There is increased 10 million times in efficiency. It's nice to compare with car. In car, big success because we reduce consumption from 20 liters per 100 kilometers to 5 now on average. Here, 10 million times efficiency increased. But there is a, a kind of saturation, uh, which is uh, just what people work now on uh, <coughs> various type of new architecture and so on to um, make uh, efficiency increase possible. But uh, we ask the question, who discovers this uh, transistor? And a uh, patent uh, from, you see, 100 years old, more or less, was uh, given. Uh, and it was idea to put, to break a glass to uh, put aluminum foil between this broken glass here and to put semiconductors in form of <coughs> copper sulfide and um, by changing gate this uh, potential between this uh, semiconductor and aluminum foil which acts as a gate uh, and uh, it was possible to change current uh, from here to here. Yeah? And, uh, okay, uh, you see that just <coughs> this. And uh, this linear field was very effective in the patents. And uh, many people, including my colleagues like David F. Shalom and others, have a prize, uh, or awarded this prize with the name of American Physical Society, give a prize of, uh, <coughs> in honor of Lilienfeld name. And who was uh, Lilienfeld? Many of us know, so of course. He <coughs> present himself in a letter to, to uh, Maria Skłodowska Kiri as Polish scientist working in Germany. So this discovery was done. This transistor was discovered in Lipsk when he was professor in Lipsk. Later, he went to states and he was in studying in Berlin, but uh, I was in high school in um, Polish high school in Lwów uh, <coughs> before going to Berlin. And now we go to quantum Hall effect. As we said, <coughs> semiconductors are very sensitive to doping, uh, impurities, def defects, light, electric field. And Klaus von Kliesing decided to take such a transistor, which we have 
left-hand side, and to put in strong magnetic field and measure something which we know as <coughs> uh, which we know as Hall effect. So we have current flowing through the material. We have voltage, which is measured in direction perpendicular to current, so it's whole voltage, and everything is in magnetic field. And what he found, which was shocking at the time, uh, that if you look on this whole effect, what you do here, you change voltage of your sample, which is just this uh, MOSFET transistor, which we have in our handies. And uh, he found that if you put this, uh, keep this in high magnetic field at a relatively low temperature, you put standard current of one mi microampere, you see kind of plateaus if you change electron concentration by changing gate voltage. Yeah? You change electron concentration by gate voltage, whole effect, as you know, measure uh, concentration, but time to time you have plateaus. And he found that these plateaus, you know, dirty material, <coughs> without any superconductivity, these plateaus have fixed values h over 2e, h over 3, and, and so on and so on. And later it was shown that this accuracy is of the order 10 to minus 10 in this case of <coughs> uh, quantum Hall effect. Therefore, it was possible having such a device to say that elementary constant are a constant, a fundamental constant, a constant, and to fix now this whole <coughs> resistance is not in this plateau region, is not measured with some accuracy, but it is set in under central condition. It has fixed values, which is related only to H and... So you said that the accuracy is 10 to minus 10. But is it the accuracy of the measurement of the plateau or of accuracy of this relation? Uh, it's uh, measurements, accuracy of measurements. So uh, having, you know, that H constant was not so accurate to measure, actually. And uh, as you know, this quantum Hall effect was used to test quantum electrodynamics and so on, as you remember. And uh, this was kind of assuming that everything is measured correctly. Uh, <coughs> other effects in measurements uh, causes that accuracy is 10 to minus 10. And it is believed that if you have proper condition, it simply was an uh, error of, measure, of that time measurement, but also related to unknown of H and A E, yeah, which that time was the fact. <coughs> okay, nowadays we produce <coughs> a semiconductor's heterostructure. Typically, you go to vacuum 10 to minus 14 of atmospheres, <coughs> uh, and we put layer by layer. We have uh, <coughs> quantum structure, two-dimensional quantum structures. And uh, if you go to <coughs> office of uh, <coughs> uh, who uh, specialize in measures, uh, also Gówny Urząd Miar, National Institute of Measure in Warsaw, they have commercial gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide uh, modulation of heterostructure. And typically in 10 Tesla, you are in this quantized region which you can use for this <coughs> metrology purposes, uh, this plateau. You can go to another material, uh, for instance, done by Tomek Wojtowicz in his MB system, uh, which photos I show. Uh, and uh, also you see in certain fields, this plateau two is uh, in lower magnetic field, uh, plateau one is uh, in higher magnetic field. And uh, we have a small program with GUM, uh, <coughs> on uh, changing the standard to use another one produced here, but uh, okay. <coughs> so, to summarize, we have this situation, and uh, looking on that, you, you immediately see that there is one uh, problem, that for instance, if we want to make a quantum ampere, we want to use superconductivity and quantum Hall effect. And superconductivity, as you know, vanishes in the magnetic field. You know that, yeah? By contrast, quantum Hall effect, you need high magnetic field. So to put together to have this ampere standard, we would prefer to have something which works at 4K, because superconductivity requires low temperature, we cannot beat that, but which work also at relatively low magnetic field, the Joseph transaction is not killed. <coughs> and, <coughs> okay, to make progress, we have to understand uh, uh, what is the origin of this quantum Hall effect, and then we can think how to improve, how to go to lower magnetic field. Yeah? And uh, physics of quantum Hall effect is so here. 
uh, we have two dimensional system. Remember, most transistors have only electron near surface or this heterostructure I mentioned also. So we have two dimensional electron system and we put strong magnetic field. So we have ideal quantization of levels. And uh, this is in bulk of the samples that we have full quantization. I mean, on surface of the sample. But if we approach edges of our sample, what edges means that the electron cannot escape from the sample, which means that an edge of electron, if we approach edges, goes up. Yeah. So we have actually a situation which we have show here that we have these Landau levels and the near edges, near these edges, one edge left, edge right, edge, we have increase of energy. So if we put Fermi energy between these Landau levels, conductivity current, which we measure, yeah, we have Hall effect, so you put current and we measure voltage. So current flow through sample and flows no, not through full surface, but flows at the edges by these one dimensional states, which are at the edges. And now, something which is very nice. If you think about group velocity, you remember from lecture of Professor Probleski, for instance, group velocity <coughs> is <coughs> derivative of frequency over momentum, yeah? over k vector. You also you remember the density of states is inversely proportional to derivative of energy over k. It's kind of easy to understand if we go from k, which does not depend on density, to k space does not depend on anything. Density is 1 over 2 pi, as we know. But if we go to energy, we have this derivative. And uh, current is just, mm, oh, current is just number of these Landau levels. And uh, 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 proportional to velocity and density of states and uh, to voltage all together putting in a single way you get this that uh, r is h over e square divided by number of Landau levels and uh, it was Taules who first noted and uh, one of the reasons he got Nobel Prize was that you can explain that very beautifully in terms of topology. Why you can explain uh, this uh, topology? Because this independence of <coughs> uh, result on impurities or shape of the sample, shape can be arbitrary and so on, means that it's topological invariant actually, this number of Landau levels. And there is um, Chern number, topological <coughs> invariance Chern number, which uh, relates this <coughs> number of uh, Landau levels to this <coughs> whole voltage. And um, so the, the things to remember, we have situation where we have strong magnetic field, electrons go around the sample because we have electric field and magnet electric field near surface, and that changes with position. And we have magnetic field and cross electric and magnetic field the electron goes over the surface, but Landau quantization means that this <laughs> number of the states is quantized. Okay. Now, oh, oops, oops. Maybe I come back. Now, important thing is that um, distance between these Landau levels is uh, related to cyclotron energy, as everybody knows, and this is just E magnetic field electric charge divided by mass of electron. In semiconductors, we know that mass of electron changes. Mass of electron is not the same <coughs> as in a vacuum. Uh, this periodic potential affects uh, dynamics of electron. And we can regulate this mass. And it is seen that we can make this mass, uh, <coughs> if we make this mass smaller, the distance will be larger. And due to this fact, uh, the distance between lambda level is larger, we can expect that the effect will appear in lower magnetic field at the higher temperature. It's kind of a naive picture, but actually true. So we go to something which has very low my effective mass. Some of you will remember graphene. Graphene has linear dependence of energy of, on the momentum, which means that near bottom, of, or near this cross neutrality point, effective mass goes to zero. Yeah, so in graphene, we expect uh, that this quantization will be better. And this is shown here, where indeed this plateau 
appears at the lower magnetic field. And it's very long, which could be explained by the fact that we have uh, defects in graphene. Here we have some specialists about graphene, maybe, on the audience. And they know if you put graphene on silicon carbide, there are broken dialing bonds, and the dialing bonds act as donor. And if you put gate, or put high magnetic field and density of stage increases, magnetic field of Landau levels, we have this plateau <coughs> very long because we discharge not electron in our graphene, but we mostly discharge its donor level. And this causes this long, long plateaus. So it's very nice, and some people claim that this actually, uh, this data from PTB, from <coughs> this <coughs> uh, uh, German uh, measure office, they believe that in a few years we will rid off of gallium arsenide and we will use this graphene as a <coughs> resistance standard. Okay, but graphene is not only a unique material to have this Dirac bands. People know for some time, maybe from 67, actually in Warsaw, that if you measure, oops, if you measure <coughs> thermoelectric power, and from thermoelectric power you determine effective mass, in compounds which is a mixture of inverted band gap semiconductor and normal semiconductor, mercury telluride, cadmium telluride, for 10% of cadmium, effective mass also increases linearly with <coughs> density of states and becomes zero if we have uh, <coughs> a number of electrons, and becomes zero if we go in, uh, to low if uh, we go to this cross neutral no point. So this material looks as a good candidate for that. And um, here you have a three-dimensional case. Uh, you have acceptors in this material typically. But if you go to two-dimensional uh, case in this <coughs> mercury cadmium telluride or cadmium mercury telluride quantum well, we want to have the, the two-dimensional system, it's that now that <coughs> we have these Dirac bands, here is density of states, and again, <coughs> density of states is linearly dependent <coughs> on energy. In two-dimensional system, we have this neutrality point, but now acceptors, which were localized in the conduction band in three-dimensional case, as our calculation shows, the recent calculation, is localized, this acceptor are localized uh, within this valence band part of Dirac cons. And uh, <coughs> now we measure Hall effect. We have Hall effect for electrons. But if we change gate voltage and we, we go to, <coughs> a negative, uh, to, to uh, holes to conduct, if we <coughs> put a voltage to have more holes, we see that this plateau starts at lower magnetic field compared to electron because there is very beautiful physics that if we have degenerate acceptor with the, <coughs> with the band, there is ordering between this acceptor, Coulomb gap, and so on, and altogether make that we have higher mobility in case of uh, resonance states. And what you see here is our measurements in Warsaw when we took samples actually from uh, Novosibirsk and we measure a function <coughs> a magnetic field uh, produced by a permanent magnet. If we measure Hall effect uh, of these holes as a function of gate voltage, we have a plateau which appears, as you see, in a magnetic field uh, of permanent magnet, which is in this case 0 0.8 Tesla. So we have situations that we can measure this quantum Hall effect in quantum wells of this material which show Dirac cons at much lower magnetic fields. But it's not all of the story, because if we go to samples not with uh, cadmium, but with manganese. Now we put magnetic impurities. This Hall effect, quantum Hall effect, appears even in lower magnetic field. Here you see beautiful plateaus uh, uh, which start at uh, 0 0.1 1 kilogauss and uh, continues to uh, 9 tesla. We have, like in graphene, very long. This is kind of good, but not very good. Uh, as this long plateau, as you see, extends hole for holes, yeah? extends from very low magnetic fields 
to very high magnetic field because of the discharging as a great voltage we uh, produce more holes as so left hand side but very low concentration of holes actually exists we mostly discharge the acceptors and therefore we have very very long plateaus Uh, why manganese is better? It's a kind of nice physics. Uh, I was involved in this physics for years. It's uh, um, for specialists. We have magnetic ions and we have this acceptor. Around this acceptor there is a ferromagnetic cloud which increases splitting of this acceptor, increases Coulomb gap and everything makes that manganese is much better compared to uh, cadmium because of this magnetic polar formation. But this was beautiful, we can go to low magnetic field, but the question is, can we go to zero magnetic field and have quantization, resistance quantization? And uh, this gentleman uh, theoretically uh, uh, showed that it's possible, that uh, we can find materials in which, topological materials, in which these edge states which produce this <coughs> quantized resistance exist. How? <coughs> Uh, soon after this uh, theoretical prediction, it was shown that indeed there is quantization in mercury telluride quantum well without magnetic field and also there is quantum anomalous Hall effect. Uh, namely, we have ferromagnetic material. Uh, we have now not magnetic field by magnetization. It is possible that without external magnetic field, without Landau levels, we have one chiral state. In case of non-magnetic material, like mercury telluride, topological material, we have pure of these uh, states, one going in one direction, one going in another direction. Why we have to have two states without magnetic field? Everybody knows time reversal symmetry. If we have no magnetic field and no magnetization, we have to have for each a state with k and spin up, we have to have states with minus k and spin down. Yeah? Time, uh, <coughs> uh, time reversal symmetry requires that we have two states, not one state, if we have no magnetization and we have no magnetic field. And how is this, uh, what is physics behind appearance of this <coughs> at states? So how we have this quantum spin hole effect? And imagine that we have quantum well. Everything requires two-dimensional system. And uh, if we have two-dimensional system and we make confinement, well, we have subband which correspond to electron built from conduction band, subband, electric subband from holes, uh, which correspond to valence band, and we have gap between them, and we have, of course, near surface, uh, we have this change of energy that the electron and hole cannot escape from our crystal. But imagine now that we have something which has inverted band structure, like mercury telluride. Where in mercury telluride is a very interesting situation, which we know for years, that in mercury telluride, cation S-type states, these gamma-6 states, are below anion P-type states. It's a relativistic effect. Mercury is very heavy, and S-type states are pushed down. So you have very unusual chemistry that electrons which normally go from cation to anion, if we have, I don't know, <coughs> sodium chloride or cadmium telluride, here electrons go from anion to cation if we make compound. Yeah. And this unusual situation leads to this inverted band structure that we have gamma at state below, <coughs> above gamma six states. And uh, if you want to uh, say this is more fancy, we can find topological invariant in the band structure. In inverted band structure, we can find that this material is not real topologically because it's very different chemistry compared to uh, normal material. And if you now have this inverted band structure and you want to stitch, uh, make stitching of the wave function between trivial, topologically trivial situation like vacuum, you end up the fact that the states like here go down, the states go down, this which form conduction band but originate from uh, a gamma 8 state goes down, and the states uh, from <coughs> gamma 6 band go up, and at the surface, at the edges, 
we have this <coughs> pair of edge states, yeah? which can give rise, because they're one-dimensional, to quantize resistance. Here are experimental data concerning the quantization of resistance in this situation. <coughs> uh, what we do here, we put anti-material and we put gates, we deplete material by these finger gates to have Fermi energy within the gap. So only conduction go through these edge states, which I said, yeah? So there is no <coughs> back conductance, everything goes by edges. And we see something which is as expected, close to, but very poor quantization. As you see, we cannot use this as a resistance standard because it's very, very poor quantized. And the same in the uh, Lawrence Mollenkamp group. Uh, they also see this <coughs> uh, so small temperature dependence, but kind of universal conductance fluctuation and uh, very bad quantization. And to see any trace of quantization, we have to use very small samples, very uh, small gate, uh, it's a micrometer gate, uh, a couple of micrometer gate, as you see scale is uh, eight micrometer here, and also they use very small sample. So <laughs> we take longer samples, its situation is not as good. <laughs> so oh, what is our model? Uh, for that. Our model, uh, sorry, our, uh, oops, pardon. our model for that is, <coughs> we mentioned several times, it's our acceptors in the samples, and uh, these acceptors are very important to improve quantization, uh, quantum Hall effect, but what we say is that the acceptors are very important to keep uh, a certain uh, gate voltage a Fermi energy within the gap. If a gap would be empty from these acceptors, uh, then a voltage uh, a Fermi level will go immediately from uh, this uh, conduction band to balance band, but acceptor keeps the Fermi energy in the gap. But at the same time, we say that the acceptor are source of backscattering of this electron between one edge state to another edge state. So we have backscattering electron move in that direction, but are backscatter by these acceptors, uh, acceptor spin go up, uh, electron spin go down, and this produces the scattering. And this scattering leads that if we increase uh, length of the sample, if we increase length of the sample, resistance start to grow. And uh, there is a parameter like uh, mean free pass, uh, LTP, uh, which characterizes growth of this <coughs> and growth of this resistance if we change length of the sample. So this is not very good standard, depends everything of length, uh, there is this uh, fluctuation, and uh, physics uh, which we make that acceptors are here uh, essential to killing uh, this quantization. And uh, 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 we did a calculation, quantitative calculation, I will not go into detail, condo scattering is very important, but we can explain uh, here is theory for um, various distances of electron and holes on acceptors. Electron is a <coughs> channel and uh, holes on acceptor. And we see that if we change the dimension of the sample from one micrometer to 20 micrometers, resistance is quantized resistance no longer there, uh, increases by um, factor of eight. And experimentally is observed the same, that for short sample we have more or less quantized value, for larger sample we have a uh, factor of eight increases uh, seen here. So this is kind of explanation why this, <coughs> why this uh, quantum spin hole effect uh, is not good for <coughs> making resistance standards. We can a little bit improve that again by forming magnetic polarons because forming magnetic polarons we kill the condo effect and indeed experimentally it is seen that the sample uh, <coughs> with manganese at low temperature when magnetic polarons are important we recover more or less this quantized value. So again magna manganese is better than a <coughs> uh, sample without magnets. But I already mentioned that if we have non-zero magnetization, what happens is that we have now uh, only one state because splitting makes that we have only a state uh, here's this uh, valence band which is built from S-type wave function 
and just conduction but uh, built from p-type wave function. But now, because we have no longer time reversal symmetry, we have uh, spin splitting and we have single states and now we expect quantization. And what was found that uh, this quantization is of the order, accuracy of this quantization is of the order 10 to minus 8. So it's kind of very promising standard, but one of bad things is that it works only at very low temperature and uh, works uh, at a very low current, relatively low current. And here you see how <coughs> we increase temperature from here to here, how parallel conductance increases. So uh, this standard works only at very low temperature. So we think that <coughs> uh, better compounds are needed to reduce this hopping conductivity due to defects in the gap of this material to have better standard which works at zero magnetic field. And we made calculations as recently <coughs> a mercury telluride chromium, which can be magnetic, ferromagnetic, and we found that uh, in this material, uh, again, there are situations that for one spin orientation, for one spin orientation, mark here <coughs> in blue, these E states, these S type states are below this H states, and therefore we expect anomalous quantum Hall effect. So, outlook dilute magnetic semiconductors are on the way to quantum ampere and quantum kilogram. Quantum Hall effect looks to be superior in mercury manganese telluride comparing to graphene. And quantum anomalous Hall effect in mercury chromium telluride is expected to be better than in bismuth antimony chromium tellurium, which is used up to now. And um, actually, mercury MB is available in Zeshov. And we already installed uh, with Tomek Wojtowicz manganese and chromium efficient cell. And assuming that we find we will find a very motivated team of people. We hope to create very good resistance standard from mercury manganese telluride and mercury chromium telluride. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your lecture. And the colloquium is open for discussion. Are there any questions or comments? Maybe I can start. Uh, if you mention these materials, uh, uh, can you uh, elaborate a bit more about, about uh, which concentration of manganese and chromium would be optimal for such a standard? So, um, uh, manganese enters very easily. We can put as much manganese we want. And for this um, mercury manganese, um, uh, mercury manganese terrain standard, we need about 1% of manganese. Very little already this is enough to produce very nice, beautiful quantum <coughs> uh, uh, quantum Hall effect. In case of chromium, we want to have ferromagnetic interaction, and chromium does not enter so easily. So <coughs> this kind of um, game which uh, we will start to find conditions under which uh, chromium enters. And calculation I have uh, I ended for three percent of chromium should be okay. But uh, this is um, not yet done. I know that uh, visible people also think about that, so we have competitors, but I think 3% <coughs> would be okay. And is homogeneity of the sample uh, critical in that case? Or uh, sorry? homogeneity, or, or I don't know. Uh, mm, quantum Hall uh, well, of course, if you have precipitation of chromium, it will uh, probably kill the effect. Yeah? We have to have more or less homogeneous distribution. By xintel rate with chromium already were used to uh, <coughs> produce uh, uh, splitting of bands in uh, bismuth compounds. So we hope that uh, it will be possible to have uh, uh, mercury chromium telluride. Thank you. Small remark, uh, not very serious, but uh, nevertheless, uh, this uh, old fashioned uh, standards had one advantage over this electric. They didn't need electricity to be reproduced. <laughs> if you and, don't uh, have electricity, all this fails. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now uh, we know that electricity is uh, we have a big problem with energy, so uh, we will come back at some point because, uh, yeah. 
when you showed these four fundamental constants, you showed a number of significant digits. Do you need them? In fact, if they are, why do you need so many significant digits if these are fundamental? Couldn't you say that H bar uh, yeah. is five? Because we want to make them as precisely um, ag uh, agree with previous uh, kilogram and previous meter. But this is only the only reason. Only reason. You could say that H bar is seven, yes? Yes. Okay. And there is very interesting, uh, and Christoph can comment. That time the Frank concept was measured, so we just had this edge of the recurves. But maybe you can comment because with time people want to adjust maybe this constant uh, when uh, rotation will change, uh, time of rotation will change. People think about to keep this uh, related to rotation of Earth. People think about uh, maybe after some years to change this constant. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But based on cesium or no, no. Uh, 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 atomic lattices? Cesium has a limitation of 15. Can we be more accurate? Mm -hmm. But there are many more atomic clocks which are much more accurate. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. As we know, there is a quantization of conductance in ballistic quantum point contacts, but it's not used for metrology. Why? <laughs> because, uh, as you know, a single impurity kills uh, already this quantization. Uh, uh, well, ballistic means that there is no impurity, but in uh, practice, uh, uh, um, accuracy of uh, quantization is very poor and depends on uh, details, uh, defects and everything. Yeah? Um, so um, it's not very handy, yeah? this accuracy. It's very funny, and this, of course, discovery was very important on the quantum Hall effect, yeah? But um, uh, Landauer Boutiquer formula then was used to quantum Hall effect, so this was very extreme, uh, important discovery, but from an uh, elementary constant uh, perspective, it's completely useless. So, what are the perspectives of having Poland as national term, uh, national um, mm -hmm. this, um, yeah, so there is, of course, one which uh, is uh, very busy with testing uh, balances or uh, meter and uh, controls shops, uh, whether they treat with uh, uh, balances. Or, the same class like PTB. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, to have the same cl uh, glass, uh, we discussed over a break that there is uh, a lot of money given to uh, Kelzer. Why there is a lot of money in Kelzer, not in Warsaw? Because uh, Warsaw is too rich to have uh, money, kills are not as rich, so they got much more money. And there is idea to create their uh, laboratory um, <coughs> uh, of measures, yeah, with uh, a collaboration of uh, technical university and in collaboration with the Central Institute of Measures uh, in Warsaw. And now, uh, as I said already to you over break, everything depends on people. If they will find good people, who will use this money correctly, you will uh, have what you want. If people will uh, be moderate, mean, nothing will happen. It's technical university. Technical. Uh, yeah. So uh, one good thing actually is uh, the director, present director of this, <coughs> uh, president of this uh, GUM, uh, the central <coughs> measure office in Warsaw, is uh, pro pro <coughs> previous uh, president of this technical university. So he is kind of a person who wants this combination uh, of uh, these two institutions, which is good because if they will work independently, this nothing will happen. So uh, this is kind of positive and uh, this person looks uh, competent. Uh, we have a lot of contact now because we collaborate, as I said. But uh, whether he will be able to create a team of people who, who will push that. Remember that uh, this PTB was formed in <coughs> uh, 1875, I think. Ah. Okay, but anyway, and uh, uh, maybe I will, uh, uh, because it's interesting. Helmholtz was first president and uh, who was boss of <coughs> uh, advisory committee? Planck. And Planck got measure uh, black body radiation. They could measure very precisely. And as 
advisory guy. He got, they said, you know, we measure very precisely, we do what we can, and this does not fit what is expected. So uh, these uh, correct measurements are not only important for normalization techniques, engineering, but also to create quantum physics. I think this, uh, this case, uh, center should organize a conference. It's, I mean, the, where we invite all the people from Poland. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I have now uh, um, on small scale contact with PTB. There was uh, just two weeks ago a workshop and I presented more or less what I said here about this manganese effect and chromium effect. <coughs> um, and I will have, in January, I will teach at school. So I now, as old professor, I'm teaching students about meteorology now. <laughs> but I think people found this uh, quite amazing, this data for manganese mercury telluride and chromium mer and mercury telluride. So in that sense, we have some links now to PTB, but uh, it must be on much higher level, of course. Yeah. You haven't mentioned uh, the uh, fractional quantum hole effect at all. Uh, does it provide any uh, does, uh, any hope for <laughs> exact yeah. for uh, so, exact uh, ampere? Uh, it's a very interesting question because fractional hole effect. I showed some data of atomic Vojtovich on atomic Vojtovich samples, and maybe you remember between two plateaus were fractional quantization. This was in very high magnetic field, so this kind of drawback. But now. If you go to literature, there's nature, maybe one year old, people see fractional quantum Hall effect in two-dimensional uh, layers uh, because uh, interactions are very important and uh, the topological things are very important. If you combine two of them, you get fractional quantization without magnetic field. Uh, so maybe uh, what you just said, maybe it's not totally, <coughs> totally absurd. How do you understand the notion of mass? Because mass is something that really does not exist. It can be estimated, but not measured. Uh, well, uh, thank you for your um, kind of uh, uh, something which I cannot say. You are uh, said in such strong ways that I can say. <laughs> so um, we still believe that um, electron has a finite mass. You may not agree with that. And uh, we believe that if we add uh, uh, a mass of electron, a mass of protons, and a mass of everything, we still uh, can say that there is a mass in this kilogram, and we can measure it um, and co connect with elementary, cons uh, elementary particles. Which what you had in mind by, by statement that you cannot measure the mass? Uh, well, uh, it's not really a question. According to me, mass indicates the level of mutual imbalance between matter and space. So any material object, mass of any material object naturally fluctuates following its interaction with, with space. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So um, uh, Krzysztof, probably you will comment, I will comment that way. Krzysztof and other people try to find a disagreement um, uh, somehow uh, uh, effects of what you are saying, but it's very hard to find for them. Yeah, Krzysztof, how it goes? I mean, they, in fact, uh, we didn't find any indication that mass of the electron charges in time, mm -hmm. or electron, I mean, more accurately, electron-proton mass ratio, because you can measure accurately the ratio, the mass ratio, and they are constant. So, so the current, uh, current understanding is that the masses of fundamental particles are constant in time. Yes, maybe the last question or comment. Uh, uh, maybe your question can be formulated, do we understand <laughs> that? And uh, uh, do we understand that mass of electron is um, 9.98 10 to minus uh, 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 31, yeah? Uh, do we understand this number? But uh, um, uh, what uh, contributes to this number? And maybe uh, the fluctuation, we are saying, contribute to this number, but... Mm. I have a question concerning the chase for a minimum uh, magnetic field because we have superconducting magnets and we can we have materials where the superconductance is still working in five six seven eight tesla so why is it so important to minimize the magnetic yeah. field oh, well uh -huh. Uh, um, superconductors you are perfectly right but josephson effect is uh, much more delicate yeah uh, so, uh, uh, just uh, effect that not like a high magnetic field. Yeah. You, you said that the superconductor 
yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah. I said uh, two things, uh, you're right, uh, Josephson effect, and I said the superconductivity, of course, uh, persists up to, in some material, up to um, <coughs> minus 100K, but still, uh, you understand my point, yeah, that we want to combine these two things, so... So maybe let thanks, uh, thank our speaker one more time. And, uh, with that, we finish this colloquium uh, and I wish you good holidays, a good start of the new year and see you in the next year. <laughs>